Welcome to another student edition of Great Books, featuring a panel of local students sharing their interest in classic literature. Here's your moderator, Jack Hatfield. Welcome. Thanks for joining us for the Great Book Show. I'm Jack Hatfield. Our panel meets monthly to discuss great works of classic and modern literature. Today we're discussing Animal Farm by George Orwell. It was written in 1943 to 44, toward the end of World War II. Many commentaries say it was a critical metaphor of Stalin's Russia. In the story, farm animals, they talk in this story, drove off the drunken, incompetent farmer of Manor Farm and changed its name to Animal Farm. They established it as a model community with the slogan, four legs good, two legs bad. Two pigs, Snowball and Napoleon, established control, but Napoleon then drove off Snowball as a traitor and got complete control. Napoleon gradually changed the community's charter and established a personal dictatorship where the slogan was changed from all animals are equal to some animals are more equal than others. Under Napoleon's rule, the other animals, with the exception of the pigs, were back in the same sorry condition as when the farmer was in control. Napoleon and pigs got all the benefits of workers' labor, while the workers got little. As Napoleon negotiated with the other farmers to sell the farm's products with the intent of keeping the profits, the rest of the animals peeked in the window. They saw no difference between the pigs and humans. Well, the, uh, the farm's uh, utopia gradually went downhill. Can you think of any one event that it was kind of the nadir of what was going on, or was it just a collection of one step after another step after another step? It was definitely a collection, like because I, it wasn't one specific event that made this all go wrong. It was a long process of, I think, them putting too much power in the hands of the pigs, not necessarily thinking for themselves. Like what Boxer said, Napoleon knows all is right. It was kind of more of a thought process turning into a process of action not necessarily one catastrophic event that drove things over the edge. I mean, I think if you're going to say one event, you would say like the uh, when they kicked out Snowball. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you don't even necessarily think about that as part of then the decline. But that is definitely the only portion where you can say it really does seem like a utopia is before Snowball is exiled. And after Snowball is exiled, it's all downhill from there mm -hmm. because Napoleon isn't a good leader. and is not caring for the people and such. Yeah, I, no, I would have to agree with, you, with uh, Rachel because when uh, when they kicked out Snowball, he represented sort of like the democratic part of the society and like truth. And uh, but Napoleon, when they kicked out Snowball, that's when he started uh, like manipulating language and started lying to the people about why he kicked out Snowball, and that's when the people became. Their, na like, their naive qualities became the downfall of their own society. And if we're going to be really specific with the direct or allegory to the Russian Revolution, Snowball is Trotsky, and uh, uh, Napoleon is uh, Stalin. And so after Trotsky gets kicked out, the one who's got the more socialist point of view uh, compared to the more uh, dictatorship idea then it kind of just all becomes worse for the people. What, what could the people have done, the workers have done? It, it, was it their fault that this happened, or were there points where they could have cr made a course correction of it? I think like being a good citizen to your like government to your society is always asking questions and is always like being educated about what's going on around you. I do, I'm not certain if they had the capacity yeah, to ask yeah. questions as they are characterized in this story, but um, could they have done something in their capacity? I'm not sure, but if they were to do something, I definitely would have thought that they should have educated themselves and tried to learn the alphabet and tried to learn how to write and how to read because then that way they would have been able to like stick to their values and like understand what was happening. I agree that definitely they should have been smarter from the beginning. I mean, they, I think had they been more educated, had they been able to, for example, read the commandments, that would have definitely given them a bit more of a heads up at, hey, the pigs are doing something bad here. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I, I like your idea that it's being a good citizen is in actuality questioning everything that they do, that your leaders do. And I think that would have been helpful because clearly, particularly the sheep, obviously, he, um, they just went along, whether willingly or not, with what Napoleon decided. Yeah, the only animal that you can argue might have had the duty to stand up and say something would be either Benjamin or one of the horses or maybe some of the pigs, but most of the pigs, the ones that did stand up were then killed. Yeah, right. So, so. You know, it's, it's really kind of a hopeless situation throughout because most of the animals aren't smart enough or aware enough to defend themselves as characterized in the book, and you then, know? So it's, then as soon as Napoleon trained these dogs, mm -hmm. and they were attack dogs. Yeah, the only uh, way he could have stopped that is stopping him at the beginning. Yeah, right. He, once they had that protection, yeah. that his, the stormtroopers, there's no way that they <laughs> could. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. And isn't that a common theme throughout history, is you don't know how bad it's going to get until it happens. It happens. Yeah. yeah. You're at rock bottom. And yeah. 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 But I think it's really interesting how uh, Orwell explores the idea that the animals aren't like smart enough to know to question their leaders because I feel like that sort of exploring like this sim symbolism that like working class people are born into the working class and maybe they don't have the utilities to get themselves higher, a higher education and to become something greater than just like mindless followers, you know? Yeah, I think specifically in this example, talking about the animals on the farm as well as the people of Russia under the czar, like they were used to being subservient. Mm -hmm. And so when a leader comes in and tries to say, we all have an opinion now, like it's all going to be better for all of us, it's a little difficult for them to know how to be active participants in mm -hmm. their society because they've never really had to do that before. They've never had to have an opinion on the government and support their government and support their community in that sort of way. So I think it's kind of natural that they wind up back at where they began because they never really understood how to change it because they'd never experienced that before and they had nothing to base it off of. So I think that made it turn out the way it did. That makes sense. I mean, um, that, that happens throughout history, like for example in South America or like in Russia, that if the population is not educated previously as to some sense of um, civic participation, I guess, um, there's like a vacuum that they just may they want to express ideas, but it's you don't have the tools or the knowledge base to effectively make your case or um, stand up for yourself. So I think that's a good idea there. I think there's something else that was going on. <laughs> they had very different personalities, and even if they were intelligent to try to get everybody uh, uh, into a group powerful enough to overthrow Napoleon's group, it would be very difficult mm -hmm. because even though they're smart, each one is going at it very differently and wants different things. Unless you get and, Boxer, then you have no chance. Yeah, as, yeah. You know, and he is loyal to a fault, you know? So Boxer you was, I, I, he, you're right, he was loyal to a fault. I mean, he was the strongest one there. He was the hardest worker, and his heart was in a good place throughout the whole book, but he seems to be like the most tragic case of this kind of lack of lack of wits, therefore, kind of Capacity, becomes a yeah. follower. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. When the leader has a lack of empathy for the people, you know, no matter how hard the people may try to do good, it's never going to turn out well. Right. You know, you can put in all the effort you want, but if the leader's not going to let you get something out of it, you're not going to get anything out of it. What, uh, what were the tools that Napoleon used to control these, these people? There, there's a lot of them, without getting into in detail on any one of them, just well, the he, dogs for sure. Yeah, the, the dogs first for sure. largest. Yeah. He creates an identity kind of like a us against them mentality with um, Jones and Pilkington and Frederick. Um, he basically uses that to kind of forge them into a unified entity by setting them against these humans and thus shifting the blame away from him. That look, your mothers might be hard, but these guys are much, much worse, and you don't want to wind up like you were. So by creating that, I think that might have been the most powerful tool there, is he created kind of a false identity there. Also, oh, go ahead. Okay. Also, I think he used the manipulation of language a lot, like more through Squealer mm -hmm. than Napoleon mm -hmm. himself, but it's still Napoleon acting, like convincing the animals that they don't understand themselves and that we're smarter, so we'll explain it to you, but by explaining it to them, they're really twisting the truth and 
putting like a different perspective on it that makes the animals think that they're on their side even though they're exploiting them. Mm -hmm. There's and definitely a lot of propaganda. Mm -hmm. and, a, and a common enemy, which is, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. Yeah. was very prevalent in, in, in history. Uh, someone to unite them by saying that these people are evil. Ceremony, music, yeah, all nationalism. those things. Yeah. Nationalism, yeah. Blind nationalism. Well, yeah, blind nationalism, all the good. sort of... Our country is the greatest place yeah. on earth. <laughs> all of the parades they had and all the stuff yeah. like that, yeah. and the singing of the song right. and the changing of the song and yeah. singing of that song and all the poetry and... The firing of the gun, the skull, yeah. 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 marches. The um, one thing I couldn't figure out is um, the, several animals at different times gave these false impressions and uh, the, the first one, that I, I don't, I've forgotten who it was, but they were killed right then. But then after that, other people at came a later forward. date came forward and gave false, and they had to know they were going to get killed. Mm -hmm. Any idea why? I could, that's, that was very strange to me. I couldn't figure that out, out either mean, because there's no direct evidence to support that they did anything or were blocked by no, or I mean, anything. So I, they were false confessions. Loyalty yeah. to the state is really what it comes down to is like a blind loyalty mm -hmm. to, yeah, like the nationalistic. Uh, ideas that he spread allowed these people to, or animals, to feel that, you know, I'm doing something good by confessing and by dying for my country, I guess. You know, like it's, they felt guilty about it and felt ashamed about it and decided to come forward because they still had that uh, loyalty to their country, even though their country didn't have that loyalty to them. Mm -hmm. I think it also might be sort of like, uh, a guilt-driven thing where they feel like they, like you're saying, they feel loyal to their country or to their farm, but they also maybe ha subliminally like feel like something's wrong, so they don't know how to identify that. So perhaps their mind comes up with these delusions yeah. and hallucinations to like rationalize why they're feeling guilty and why they feel because they're not quite intelligent enough to recognize that there's something there's wrongdoing happening but they perhaps know it on some level and so their mind creates these like hallucinations or whatever you want to mm -hmm. call them and then they think they're facts so then it removes them from the situation they die but sometimes yeah that was a, um one thing that, that kind of, as it started to go wrong there, to almost to the very end, a lot of the animals went along with it because they said, we're free, even though they weren't. Did you understand that? that why they, they would remember. say free? Because, well, sorry, because they don't, they said a lot of them didn't remember what it was actually like with Jones. Like they said Jones and all that he stood for had, had slipped out of their minds or something like that. Um, so I think one, they, they had nothing to base their kind of comparison on except what Squealer was telling them. And that, again, that false identity thing that, look, hey, you're animals, you're doing the work. That must mean you're running the state. So therefore, you own your lives kind of thing. So I think that false identity, again, is, has convinced them to think that um, they still are in control of their destinies and that this is still a good life. Yeah. Also, I think the whole like uh, freedom thing uh, to them being ruled by a fellow animal is probably more free than being ruled by man. You know, like when they were ruled by Jones, they didn't have any say and they couldn't communicate with him. So it was like a complete and utter dictatorship. And towards the end, it completely turned to that with Napoleon as well. But in the beginning stages, they could still communicate with Napoleon. And even though he was in the early stages of dictatorship, they probably did feel more free than they did under Jones. Yeah, it's the idea that they chose this leadership. Yeah. Because they chose to overthrow the previous power, they have now chosen this government in or, a way, yeah. even though it's not the best situation, it's hard to admit that doing something like that is wrong or it ended up negatively, especially if, like, by, especially by the end, they don't have any generations of people who actually remember or people who know what it was like to actually live when Jones was in, in charge. So it's a little bit of the idea of we did this, and so we should support it no matter what. And I, th I think they fell in love with the idea of freedom and got so invested in it that it kind of overshadowed what was actually going on. Mm -hmm. And they were continually t taught that, that freedom, they were free, and they, mm -hmm. they weren't at all, so yeah. Mm -hmm. 
did w one interesting thing that um, I'm trying to remember the the animal, but um, the the Candy Mountain. Oh, the crow. The crow. The crow. The yeah. yeah, yeah. He came back and said that you know, if you die, you go to this wonderful place and all that, and and uh, which I understand. The, the, but but uh, the uh, dictator uh, rewarded him for that. Unlike, say, Stalin's Russia, which was in, totally against religion. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder why Orwell threw that in. Well, I think it was to be, make um, further that connection between Napoleon and who Jones was original. And Jones, like, because they said that um, Jones liked Moses and that it was like, Moses was like his pet or something. So I think that was kind of connecting, making Napoleon be a bit more acting like a man that um, he's rewarding Moses for spreading these, these um, rumors just like Jones did. Pie in the sky and... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what the exact connection is between like the like Candy Mountain thing and like the actually spreading it to the animals because I didn't completely understand that either. Like I didn't understand why the cops concept of an afterlife would be a desirable thing for Napoleon, but your connection makes sense. Yeah, I mean, the only thing is, like, at the beginning, it's their hope of, like, a god, and at the end, I think it comes back, and maybe he's trying to represent that idea in the people, even if there weren't directly uh, people spreading those ideas out loud in Russia. I'm not really sure. I'm not 100% knowledgeable about everything in the Russian Revolution and such, but for sure it could represent the idea that at some point Stalin knew there were people who were religious in his country and just kind of let them be. Well, he didn't let them be. Yeah, <laughs> but... No. But it would, would stick to the story. Um, somewhere. What do you take away from this, the story? What It ended up not a happy story no. at all, and so um, virtue was not rewarded. <laughs> if anything, uh, evil was rewarded. Mm -hmm. what, what did you take away from it? Well, I think it... The lesson here is that it's important to be vigilant from the beginning, to ask questions, to be educated enough to be able to find fault in what your leaders are doing so that you can stick up for yourself and that if you're going to make, make a drastic change, try to make the world a better place, that you need to be very careful so that you don't wind up make, making what you thought would be your utopia into a worse situation than before. So uh, one, in vigilance, and two, in forethought in a way. For me, the story left me wondering, like, is politics always corrupted, you know? Like, I was, that really made me question, like, my beliefs of, like, I like to believe that everyone is, like, born a good person and, like, things that happen to you shape your character. But reading this story and thinking about, like, dictatorships and people who are power-hungry and greedy, um, like, it makes me question, like, is there any government that can be uncorrupt, you know? like? And perhaps, like, if there is there a de deconstruction of the first society, will the second society ever be any better, or will it always just be this power vacuum filled by the next corrupt dictator, you know? And, like, how do we keep people honest and keep people genuine when they're in their leadership? Yeah, I think the best way to come out of this is to say, well, I need to be informed about what's happening in my country and be informed about what's going on in my life because. It all started because the animals didn't speak up for themselves and weren't educated enough to read and weren't. So it's, I guess, yeah, that's the only way to avoid it. And for sure, it's, it makes you think about power and how corrupting power can be, mm -hmm. you know, because everyone always likes to be like, oh, no, that wouldn't ha I wouldn't get corrupted by power. But it, it makes it seem very possible. You know, there's always a way to be like, oh, but it's not really my fault. So there's a lot of different perspectives I feel like you could take on it, but that would definitely be some of the main ones that he leaves yeah. behind. And uh, if taking example of, of the United States and other Western countries, setting it up so there's checks and balances. Mm -hmm. So there's always a check on that someone who tries to be a dictator. Mm -hmm. That's always seems to work. Anything else that got out of this? I, usual stories you read, uh, somebody in there is going to be 
happy at the end. But this was... Napoleon was happy. Yeah. 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 For me, just reading this story, like, imagining it visually was very entertaining. Thinking about yeah. pigs walking on two legs and that type of thing. Pigs trying to, like, write with their hooves. I was very... Yeah. Cute. But other than that... Yeah. I mean, the... The one part that I always found like fascinating or like chilling in this book is how they change all of the ten rules of animalism, mm -hmm. like have him painting on the wall like new stuff. That's always the thing that like made me the most uncomfortable reading this because it makes you wonder like how often that actually happens in our societies, like people twisting the laws to be something they don't really mean, you know, and that's scary. Yeah. <laughs> how they call them the commandments and like you yeah. think about how religion has been twisted in the past with like terrorism and just like, you know, every religion has its dark history and how people mm -hmm. have twisted it to set each other against one another. Mm -hmm. One thing that jumped out at me was when uh, there, there were two people, it was Snowball and Napoleon, and uh, Snowball was the, the intelligent pig and he came up with all these schemes and all these plans to do anything. And the only thing Napoleon did was to attack him. Mm -hmm. And he never came up with any scheme of his own. And then steal them. Yeah, Very interesting. and I was thinking, that reminds me of <laughs> but, uh, Reminds anyway. me of someone. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Never creating like your own original policies and just attacking those of others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That the real politician creates something rather than just trying to destroy. Yeah, exactly. The, like good people will always try to like pro progress and create change, and evil people will just try to deconstruct what is already there for their own gain. Or they said they don't have any uh, plans or intelligence or anything to look out to the future. Uh, in the story, though, um, it started off that way, but then Napoleon they did have a master plan, and he came out pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> anything else that just jumped out at you? Any questions? Or, um... Um, boxer's character. Just I know we already touched on him, but... I just had a lot of sympathy, empathy for him too, because like he's a hard worker. He doesn't want to do anything wrong. He, like when he thinks that he killed the one of the men in the first battle, he feels a lot of guilt because he never wanted to kill anyone. And I just really like felt for him and thought like he's such an idealist. Like he wants to believe in the good in everyone. And in the end, when he ends up being b betrayed by the people that he worked so hard for, I think that was just one of the really emotional pieces where Orbal just like drove it home how twisted the world can be sometimes, and how um, it like it's good leadership, but it's not benevolent leadership. Mm -hmm. Like Napoleon is a good leader; he makes people follow him, but he's not a uh, empathetic or like benevolent leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. I just like how short of a book it is that it was able to touch on so many large topics. Yes, it is. You know, yeah. it's just, it's able to encompass a lot of things. There's a lot of things you can talk about through it. Like, no matter what time period it is, this book will always be relevant because it's kind of so broad. You know, there's so many ideas you can tie to it, even though it's only barely, like, 150, 200 pages, you know? So it's, that's, that's something that I feel like is important to notice about this, is that there's a lot of big important ideas. Yeah, I agree and I, I like how like how you said it's a short book and it's kind of funny in parts like it's comical but in, yeah. at the same time it kind of really pokes at the heart of statecraft and kind of makes you question um, kind of what is is there really goodness here is should we trust this and but at the same time kind of makes you think hey can we do this better. There was one character I couldn't and a lot of them I could I could uh, say, ah, well, uh, Boxer was like somebody I know or whatever. But the cat yeah. is, uh, never worked. Mm -mm. Uh, when he voted for something, he voted on both sides. Uh, and he got away with a lot simply because he was cute. <laughs> but, uh, I, yeah. I, makes sense? I don't know. Hmm? I was trying to think about who the cat might represent, like, in a society. and. People who are sitting on the fence all the time, yeah. I guess. That's all people who don't really contribute much but are always there anyway. Yeah. People the who are bystanders, the kind of, yeah. yeah. Who kind of look on at everything kind of coldly and then kind of help one side than the other. People yeah. who don't vote. Yeah, people <laughs> who don't pick a side. Voters. People who never pick a side <laughs> because they're afraid to 
have someone get mad at them. Yeah, people who say like, oh, I don't talk about politics. Yeah. Mm. Well, He's undecided voter number uh, five. I said the discussion <laughs> this morning was somebody I know well. It wasn't because they're scared, it's just the other. Anyway, I won't get into that. Yeah. Um, the uh, one thing I thought Orwell did a good job of of bringing up the split between management and workers, mm -hmm. which you know forms Marxism and a lot of other isms, <laughs> and the uh, in the story that management got all the uh, all the, the goods, and the workers got nothing, mm -hmm. even and but they, they did nothing. The, the workers are the ones that did all the work. Mm -hmm. the seems like a perennial problem in any society that even the people who do the work sh never seem to reap the benefits like it's the person who sit, who the person who manages people who well, who gets to live in the fancy house in the nice neighborhood not the person who actually works hard and works long hours and has a harder life even though that person is producing or um, building it just seems to be a perennial problem in um, any money-based society that Orwell is definitely poking at there. You know, I was thinking, did, did any character come out well in the story? And I was thinking, maybe the donkey. Oh, yeah. The Molly, the other horse. The Molly who ran, yeah, Molly right. who ran away. Nothing yeah. really happened to her. <laughs> her life did I also same. always wonder about Snowball. Like, where did he actually yeah. go? Because yeah, right. they say he yeah. comes back and, but, like, no, destroys yeah. everything, but he, it's not really, yeah. yeah, you don't really believe yeah. that. I expe you know? Yeah, I expected Snowball to meet some to meet some sort of nasty end because um, Stalin eventually had um, Trotsky shot in Mexico, but um, Snowball just kind of shot, poof. stabbed, drowned. Yeah. He just yeah, that he just disappears and is yeah. brought up throughout the end. Did the uh, well, did you like it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've read it before, but I still liked yeah. it. Yeah, Reading this is it one again of my favorite books. A couple years later. <laughs> uh, I, First time I read it was well. First of all, I saw it like a Disney comic uh, oh, yeah. show on it, was weird. I've seen which was that. <laughs> it was kind of funny. But then you get into it and all of the the parallels with modern society and mm -hmm. what's going on. It was mm -hmm. fascinating mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. And Orwell writes well, so yeah. So it's an easy read. Yeah, and it was compared you know, to some compared yeah. to some books, it's you know it's a breeze. Yeah, it makes yeah, it fun. which is a big plus. <laughs> yeah, <text. laughs> not a lot of lengthy language or. Like, there's some, but like, it's not like there's big paragraphs of description entirely, and then. Big paragraph, yeah. that's one sentence. Yeah, so it's, it's a good, fast read. And it's fun, yeah. in its sad, depressing way.